today we will see group comparison suggest comparison that is to compare different conditions now that different conditions could be anything for example here in the in the slide if you can see that there is a red box and then there is a blue box and then you have several objects star shaped objects if you want to compare the box 1 to box 2 in respect to star shaped object you can say that there are five in the red box and three in the blue box so in a very crude manner this is also a comparison and uh, though in the statistics it is a much more complex but this is one of the simplest simplest example you can see now the condition in the biological experiment could be anything whether your aim or whether you have been studying the antimicrobial activities where you are testing the antimicrobial activity of any pure compound or any crude extract and then you are measuring the mortality of the uh, I mean mortality you are that is your response variable right so similarly you can also expose your plants animal tissues or cell lines or whatever you are working on with the abiotic stress with an aim to understand the influence of these abiotic stress conditions and as a response variable, you can check either the growth of the plant animal or whatever animal you have been studying or plant you have been studying or otherwise the metabolites, enzymes or any other parameter, biological parameter, right? So hope that is clear that condition is something which you have been studying and as a response variable, you have been measuring something to prove the, or to find out the influence of the condition on the variable. The same thing goes for the biotic interaction. It means that you, uh, you may be studying the metabolites or enzymatic assays or, uh, or uh, whatever the variable you have been me uh, measuring in response to pre-predator or pests or anything, right? So, so basically, when you are comparing two conditions, that one could be any control, it means that just if you are if you are working on the crude extract and any solvent and test on the organism or any bacterial cell or whatever microbe you have been using and then uh, extract plant or whatever food extract you have been studying. So now that you have two different conditions and when you are comparing these two that is called as group comparison. In the group comparison, not only the two conditions you can measure, you can measure more than two conditions. And in that case, we can uh, we can see that how multivariate uh, or multiple conditions can be used. So those all things we will be seeing today. One such example here, suppose I have been studying any plant, uh, I mean carbon dioxide response on the plants and then set up the experiment in a way that one is in the ambient condition that is a control the second some particular concentration of carbon dioxide some particular concentration of carbon dioxide let's say 5 500 ppm there is a second test condition or the treatment condition where i've been studying 800 ppm and then there is a third where 1000 ppm so group comparison means Either you compare the control with one particular treatment or control with all the conditions together or separately. It means that either the, uh, I mean, response you can measure between two or in more than two conditions. To make slightly complicated, we have been seeing that these days, if we have to understand, let's say, the effect of climate change on any plant or on any animals, then we know that the one independent variable does not act alone. In that case, you have two conditions or it can be more than two conditions. But to give you an example here, you have carbon dioxide and then you have temperature. Now, this is multifactorial experiment where you have the ambient temperature condition. And in this example, I am showing you one particular temperature. This will go in ambient. So in ambient, you have two conditions now. Further, 
one is with the ambient temperature and the another one is the treatment one same goes with your t1 t2 and t3 right in this condition also when you are making the comparison this is called as group comparison and several tests are there which are significance tests are there which you can use in order to find out the differences in the response variables aditya has already explained on the day one that whenever we are performing any experiment or whenever we have any scientific questions in mind there are hypotheses behind that and then based on the hypothesis we are performing the experiment and getting the data now most of the statistical analysis actually it should start when you are when you have your question in mind at that time itself you should know that how many samples you are going to use what should be the uh, i mean what is your hypothesis however the statistical analysis starts once you get the uh, observation or the result after the experiments right statistical analysis can be understand in this way in three different steps first is that what is the study design and sample so study design comes mostly before you plan your experiment and the same like how many samples you are going to use or whether your whether your samples are independent or paired that we will see in a couple of minutes later the second step is the descriptive statistics and the third one is the inferential statistics or you can also call as significance test now this significance test is depend depends completely on the descriptive statistics or the uh, i mean on your data so there are several terms and the uh, uh, concepts which will be coming when we are going to see the descriptive statistics or the significance status uh, significance test let's see one by one all the first when you are designing your experiment or when you are having the samples right so in that in that stage you will always hear about independent sample and the repeated samples or the paired samples so independent samples it means that different participants or the different samples are used in each condition let us understand this with one example suppose you have six seaweeds over here and then you have to do experiment or you want to know that what is the impact of temperature on the seaweed at different time points so let us suppose i have given 32 degree celsius to know the impact of the temperature on the seaweed in the short term and in the long term with the short term let's say one day and the long term let's say one week in this case if you are using three individual for day 1 and three individual for the for one week right so when you are making this kind of independent samples for different time point this is called as independent sampling or the benefit of uh, this independent sample is that you are not uh, you are not uh, i mean uh, if you, if let us suppose that you expose any seaweed or any plant for one day and then the, after taking the photosynthetic uh, measurement you you continued it for one week then it is not seven days it can be eight days right even though if you are going to put it uh, one or two day for the uh, acclimatization that may impact your studies so this is a condition of plant similarly in the animals suppose you have any subject and you have exposed it to one particular uh, condition the same the same subject when you are exposing it to another i mean in the another experiment that can have uh, the implications of the previous exposure so that is independent sample now in the treated i mean in the repeated samples or the paired samples in this example you can see that you have again six seaweeds and then you expose it to a 32 degree celsius you took the reading after the day one and then you because since it's a invasive measurement i am talking about photosynthetic response uh, using diving pan or whatever and then you continue it for one week so in this case what has happened that you are using the same set of individual for one day and one week experiment the benefit is that you will have more number of replicates in the day one and the day one, uh, week one because you can see that here whatever result you are getting you are getting from three individual whereas here you are getting from six individual 
so that is one of the effect i mean one of the advantage and also it it removes the individual effect so suppose if this particular so suppose if this particular individual is not performing well right or, or is having some different uh, 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 conditions then it will have the impact that is the individual impact will be there in the statistical analysis or your result let's say so that is being neglected in the repeated analysis but the cause is that there is a order effect it means that uh, as i said that the performance uh, may may be affected because of the previous exposure so depending on the individual sample or the repeated sample the statistical test varies and that we will see in either uh, in, i mean for example if you are doing t test for comparison of two samples then independent sample t test or paired t test so so based on your sampling the uh, the significance test what you are going to use varies hope that this is clear let us go to some other uh, topics i mean terms and concepts the first and the foremost is the null hypothesis so in a statistical test tests a null hypothesis now this null hypothesis it suggests or it states that there is no difference between the two test condition or the population now again giving you this example where you have i mean carbon dioxide in the different concentration in two tanks having the uh, plants the null hypothesis states that the photosynthetic response if you are measuring from the algae in the ambient and in the 500 ppt ppm concentration so null hypothesis says that the photosynthetic rate will be similar right there won't be any difference between the two conditions that is the null hypothesis now if there is a null hypothesis then there is a alternate hypothesis because that is what you will check whether null hypothesis will be true or null hypothesis will be rejected so the alternate hypothesis will be there is a real difference between the two conditions right so again the same example you will see that you have the carbon dioxide constant two different carbon dioxide concentration and then you will see that uh, uh, alternate hypothesis suggests that the difference in the photosynthetic uh, parameter what you have been observing is a real now if the null hypothesis is true then it says that any change or any see uh, if you are keeping six replicate in the normal or in the ambient and six replicate in the uh, treatment one definitely the mean is going to be vary right it will not come exactly same uh, mean now the null hypothesis if it is true it states that whatever difference you have been observing it is just by chance and it is not a real uh, uh, difference in the mean right however if the null hypothesis is rejected then it means whatever difference you are seeing in the mean it's a real difference and then in most of the case what we aim uh, i mean if you want to get any meaningful data out of it i am not saying that you will force your uh, uh, speculation on your hypothesis but in most of the cases we expect null hypothesis to get rejected because if the null hypothesis is getting rejected then only you will see some some difference and that can uh, give some meaningful data meaningful results in your observation or in your experiments however it is not always true as we all know that uh, whatever we aim uh, may not work as a uh, null hypothesis many times are true and then the difference what we are observing it's just by chance now how would you understand or how would you say that the null hypothesis is true or null hypothesis is rejected in that case there is a term called as p value which i will come just in the next slide uh, one thing what you need to remember is that the statistics gives you idea that how probable your null hypothesis is it will never tell you either this way or that way it will never tell you that yes it is exactly like that or it is exactly not like that so there is always a probability there is always uh, i mean uh, there is always some chance 
and now it is up to you that up to what chance you are saying that the null hypothesis is accepted or null hypothesis is rejected and that term is a p value we all are aware that what p value is it is a chance that the difference what we are getting is because i mean it's just by chance or it is a real difference if you are considering p value 5 like 0.05 it still says that 5% chance of getting difference in the two sample are considered significant right so if you are saying the p value as uh, 0.05 or uh, lesser than 0.05 what we generally understand or generally consider that your null hypothesis is rejected and that uh, the, the 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 differences what you are observing between the two conditions are real so in most of the cases we are using 5% right anything less than 5% or anything more than 5% right if you have a value less than 5% or you have more than 5% if it is less than 5% it means that your null hypothesis is rejected and the difference is real if it is more than 5% then your null hypothesis is true and the difference is just by chance now in many cases we know that this is just a number arbitrary number that we have uh, that we all have taken into account that uh, this is a uh, you know like a mark or a stone that uh, if it is more than 5 or less than 5 define completely your uh, experimental test uh, first we should know that this is called as alpha value it means if we are considering p is equals to 0.05 the alpha value is 0.05 and this is completely up to us what alpha value you want to you want to keep to reject or to accept your hypothesis okay now uh, another thing once you are considering p value either less than or more than 0.05 either it will tell you whether it is your null hypothesis is rejected or accepted some cases what happens is that if p value is 0.05 it means that there is a still 5% chance that your uh, null hypothesis is true but you are rejecting it in that case you incur type 1 error uh, this will keep on coming even today and tomorrow in different uh, statistical test so what you need to understand is that if it if it is type 1 error it means that you are rejecting the hypothesis even though when you should not reject it and then there is a type 2 error it means that you are accepting the i mean uh, null hypothesis and even though when it is not true so mostly when you are increasing your p value i mean decreasing your p value towards 0.01 or 0.001 then in that case uh, you are incurring type 2 error whereas if you are uh, considering 0.05 or more than this then you may incur type 1 a uh, p value alpha value is the value uh, which uh, above which or below which we can decide that uh, uh, that there is a significance or there is a no significance or, or you can say that uh, the the value at which you reject or accept your null hypothesis so that is alpha value and uh, uh, in general we are using 0.05 because this is a value where you generally do not compromise much between the type 1 and the type 2 now we have seen in this particular graph that uh, depending on the sample you decide the significance test and then we have seen that in significance test you either accept or you reject the null hypothesis right now Uh, when you should use which particular test it's a really uh, difficult choice to make considering that you have so many of functions and so many of a statistical test one important distinction which we can make in the statistical analysis for the significance test is choose choice between the parametric and the non parametric test so parametric test it assumes the statistical distribution with known mathematical properties and what are these distribution and properties we will be seeing in a couple of minutes where is a non parametric you do not rely on any distribution so it means that 
uh, you are not considering too much uh, 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 assumptions in the non-parametric uh, analysis and that is why it loses some power. So the, uh, definitely we are using or we generally use in many times when the data is not following the assumptions of the parametric test, you do the non-parametric test. And if the if the sample size is not enough, if, if it is less, then you do lose the uh, you do lose the uh, uh, what do you say the power, and then you can you can tend to commit more type two error. It means that you fail to detect the true difference between the groups. Those things we will see uh, when we are doing the SPSS just after this uh, introductory talk. In the parametric test you assume there is a statistical distribution and mathematical properties. So four important assumptions generally we make. And if your data is following these four assumptions, you generally do a parametric test, which, which is t-test or ANOVA. In general, we know this, right? If your data is having outliers, if your data is not equal in all the conditions, if your data does not follow the normal distribution, and if your data does not have equal homogeneity of variance, in that case, you use non-parametric test, which does not assume these assumptions, right? And as a result, you might have seen in the in the research article that people do a man witney test or Wilcoxon test or Kruskal Wallis test, right? So these are non-parametric tests. This we will see later. Let us see first today parametric test. First and the foremost is outlier. Right? In the outlier, what it means is that any data point or the sample or the observation which lies at the abnormal distance. So in this particular, uh, in this particular uh, example, you will see that you have 8, 10, 11, 65, 9, 10 and 11. So what it means is here that most of your data or most of your value is, is more or less near. Right? Just because of one value 65 and one value 3, right? it will provide the skewness in the normal distribution. So you generally tend to remove this value. This value may be generated because of uh, several issues which we will be seeing now. Two very good way to see whether your data is having outlier or not. First is the scatter plot and the second one is the box plot. In the scatter plot, what happens is that if all the data or all the samples are coming within one range except few, for example, here if you see in the x and the y axis, this, this two particular uh, dot represents the sample or the data is very much away from, uh, from all the other data, right? So this too can be considered as outlier. In the box plot, which we'll be making in the SPSS now, you will see that this box plot is having quartiles and that these quartiles are having medians as well as the whiskers. Any data which is not coming near to median or uh, in the whisker range, that data is considered as outlier. Now, in many cases, in the real condition when you do the experiment, you do have the outliers and that outlier sometime may be just because you have uh, you have put a wrong data in Excel or sometime it is a very intuitive data which you cannot just uh, remove it from your, uh, from your data set. So, in all the cases, there are several ways or uh, there is no clear answer that what you should do with the outlier, but in general what people do is in first case that you drop the outlier it means that if if this is the if this is the range of the data one particular data if it is bringing skewness in the normal distribution you can remove it but suppose if it is not 65 and if it is something around 15 or 20 and still if it is providing if it is coming as outlier that you cannot simply remove it in that case since I said that outlier is an assumption of a parametric test, if you do not want to remove your outlier, you can conduct non-parametric test. It means that if you have two samples and if you are comparing with t-test, if you aim to, aim to do with t-test, you can alternatively use 
non parametric equivalent of t test and then check if your uh, uh, i mean what is the inferential statistics in that case the second option uh, which also many people does is that you modify the outlier by replacing the next largest value now in that case in this case you have 8 10 11 65 9 10 and 11 first of all you arrange either in ascending order in the descending order and then you will see that the uh, next uh, largest value is 11 now if you will replace it with 11 right you will lose the directionality in a way that if it is also 11 then it is equivalent to this so sometime what you should do is you should do 11 but i mean uh, near about the second largest value since it is a large value you can put 11.5 or you can put 12 so this is also you can do when you are dealing with the outliers the fourth one and the most suggested one is that you let the uh, uh, outlier be like this whatever is there in your data you try running the significance test or the inferential test with and without outlier and check whether the inferential statistics tells you something if in both case if your data is having significant difference then better is to keep also another way this is called as sensitivity test another way is that you run parametric and non parametric test both with the data with the uh, with the outlier and check whether whether you are getting in both the times a significant result a significant difference or you can say that your null hypothesis is rejected or null hypothesis is true whatsoever both in the same i mean in the same condition same result in both the condition same result then you can leave it right uh and the last option is to transform the dependent variables so the, how do we do the transformation i will show you but uh, it is not suggested that if you have outlier but you do not have the uh, changes in the normal distribution you just have the outlier but it is not impacting your uh, normal distribution curve then better is not to transform this uh, dependent variable so these are some of the options which you can play with when you are dealing with the outliers now uh whatever questions you have uh i will be taking it once we finish this so that uh, it does not uh, break the rhythm now the second assumption so first assumption we have seen is outlier the second assumption which i have not uh, gone in detail but it says that you should have the equal data in all the condition so suppose if you have uh, group a and group b in group a if you have five data point in group b also you should have five data point if that is not there that affects the f statistics and t statistics which is a parametric test and uh, which provides or which includes either type 1 or type 2 error so we should be uh, uh, not uh, conducting any statistics with unequal sample data set if you do have unequal uh, sample data set it is better to go with non parametric uh, statistics test now the second is normal distribution what normal distribution suggest is a symmetric about the mean right so you basically have a bell shaped curve where most of your data comes in the central part with some uh lesser i mean either i mean in the tail region you do have lesser values lesser data sets right and uh, 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 as soon as i mean as you are moving away from the peak then the then the sample data is lesser and lesser right so this is this is an a typical normal distribution curve uh, which is in the bell shaped uh, curve well bell shaped graph it do have if you if you remember wait i will just do it this one okay if you see carefully what do you observe you see that you have a mean you see that you have a mean i mean uh, it has the two two properties any normal distribution data is having two property or you can say that it is affected by two things uh one is average and the second one is the standard deviation right 
Now, if the standard deviation is too high, then you will have skewed data either in the right side or in the left side. And then if you have more or less similar uh, data with fewer uh, uh, data which is varying from the mean, you will have a normal distribution. There are two different ways you can analyze or you can assess the uh, normal distribution. First is a numerical method and second one is a graphical method. So in the graphical method, you can you do not need to know much of the statistical tool and functions. You can see the histograms. We know that histogram is made with frequency in class, right? So you do have the frequency in the y-axis and the class in the x-axis and then based on that you can check the histogram. And if the if the curve or if the if the graph or the histogram graph shows a normal distribution or a bell shape, then that's a uh, that's a normal distributed data. The second one is the QQ plot, that is quartile quartile plot, which I will be explaining in a moment. But if you if you have less samples and if you are uh, in the less sample, generally histogram will not form. A, normal distribution at as it is showing in this particular uh, image. In that case, you do a statistical test and then there is a, a term called as a skewness and kurtosis. If the, if the value is moving away or if the peak is moving away in the right side or in the left side, then the value of the skewness will be in positive or in the negative. If it is a proper normal distribution, the skewness value will be more or less zero. The same goes with kurtosis. So what kurtosis, uh, what kurtosis says, suggest is, if you have a peak in the center, oh, okay. if you have a peak in the in the center, in the I mean, uh, if the peak is there in the bell curve, then you have kurtosis value is zero. If you have more uh, diverged data or you can say with a more wider distribution the kurtosis value will be in negative or if you have a very sharp peak then the kurtosis value will be in positive so i am not going into the details i'll show you just the formula how it is calculated we are not going to do it the second important and the most used test one of the most used test is sapiro weld test which is indeed based on the QQ plot curve, this curve, right? So let us go and see just the formula that how skewness and kurtosis is calculated. It is dependent on your variance. So uh, there is a role of variance. What uh, again, not going into the mathematical calculation, but this is how when you are seeing or when we will see now that the skewness and kurtosis value in positive or negative when we do the statistical test. More or less this kind of mathematical formula is used there to find it out. What you just need to remember if, if it is a right skewness, skewness will be in positive. If it is a left, left skewness, the uh, skewness will be in negative. If you have a sharp peak, then kurtosis will be greater than zero. If you have a wider distribution, then kurtosis will be lesser than zero. Okay? And if it is a normal distribution, kurtosis will be zero. Uh, quickly we will see that what is this normal quartile quartile plot so normal quartile quartile plot uh, uh, quartile or you can say quintile quintile when you have more data quartile if you just have four data so four data is quartile and more than four data or any data is quintile so quintile is technically speaking is a median in this particular uh, image if you can see what you can see that there are there is a uh, anything there is a one sample and uh, once you took some reading let us suppose if it is a gene expression reading for one gene uh, in 10 different numbers or you can say that 10 gene with the gene expression values here just assume what will you see is that the median the center point above which half of the data or below which half of the data is the median right now the median is called as quantile. So it can also be called as 50% quantile because it has distributed your data or which has divided your data into two equal parts. 
or if you say that the whole data is 1 then 0.5 so 50 when you say in percentage or otherwise 0.5 point we will see the same uh, uh, concept when we will see the box plot but for now we will see this uh, normal qq plot so in QQ plot, you do have your actual observed data, that is your data contents, where you have in center you have median. So median is a 50% content. If you have 75% of the data below, then this is a 25% content. And if you have if you divide the data further in 25%, this is called as 25% content. Similarly, the last value will be zero quantile or you can also say if you are more familiar with percentile then quantile or percentile is, is the similar value and then this is 100% quantile right so this is the meaning of quantile now this is your actual data which you have observed which is coming here right we know that when we are considering about uh, uh, about the parametric test we are assuming a normal distribution now if this is a normal distribution graph, a bell shaped curve, right? You keep all the points. It is also possible to make this in Excel sheet. So you put all the nine points, which is here, and assume what will you assume? You will assume that most of the value will be near to the mean. That is the hypothesis of the or that is the way you consider the normal distribution and then the lesser value near to the tail and this will give you a normal quantile values when you plot the data quantile which is the actual data and the normal quantile by putting after into the normal distribution curve you will get a kind of a straight line if the data is normally distributed if the values are going very much far or very much near as you can see in this particular case uh, if this is the straight line and if the values are not staying on the straight line whereas going in the positive or the negative skewness then it means that your data is not normal so this is another way to observe or to examine your normal distribution curve right so you can do the uh, if you have enough samples, if you have, let us suppose, more than 25 samples, if you have more than 25 samples, or let's say a large number of samples, just by looking into the histogram, you will be able to say that whether your data is following normal distribution or not. If you have lesser data and if the histogram is not so clear, then you take the help of the statistical analysis and that in this case, skewness and the kurtosis values or otherwise the more statistical uh, sound test that is superior spiro i mean superior will test uh, another thing which you should keep in mind it's uh, that any value of skewness between plus one and minus one is okay for a statistical test because we all know that what we are talking about is a mathematical model and what we are talking about is a hypothetical situation when you really go and examine any of the biological sample collected from environment or the or the test which you have been performing in the laboratory it may not exactly form how the normal distribution bell curve is so definitely there will be some skewness and some kurtosis at that i mean very rarely you will get a very normal distribution where there is no skewness or no kurtosis so in this case uh, if you have plus one to minus one skewness that is acceptable if you have plus 2 to minus 2 kurtosis, that is acceptable. So this is again a number uh, which you can avoid or which you can keep in mind uh, when you perform the statistical test. And of course, when you are doing with the numerical uh, uh, analysis or numerical understanding of norm, uh, that normal distribution, then these are the tests. And as I said, that Sapiro Wilk is based on the normal quartile, uh, quartile plot and this is actually the uh, actually derived from the curve slope here okay so this is how you find out the normal distribution and that is the importance of normal distribution that if your data is not normally distributed you cannot perform the parametric test so what do you do if your data is not 
not normally distributed. So you cannot simply go and do the non-parametric test because as I said that in the non-parametric test, the chances of the type 2 error is high. And then you will, uh, you may do mistakes. That is definitely a last option or you can say a second option. But before that, you can do the transformation of the data. And then the property of the, uh, the numerical data, if you transform it, can bring it to the normal distribution curve or normal uh, or more or less similar to normal distribution. Uh, the guy, I mean, uh, uh, there is a manual which uh, which is quite uh, acceptable, which suggests that if you do have a very uh, extremely positive or the negative skewness of the data, then you can go with the inverse reciprocal or reciprocal. So if it is positive skewed, then you just go with the reciprocal of the data. It means you transform your data reciprocal. If it is negatively skewed, you go with the inverse reciprocal. Similarly, if you have a strong positive skewness, not extreme positive skewness, then it's better to transform into the log, log uh, based in. And if you have somewhat positive or some, somewhat negative skewness, you better to go with the square. Again, it is not a hard and fast rule. It is just that how most of the data behaves. Right? So you can keep a point, you can keep an understanding that if, you, if your data is moderately positive or negative skewed, then you go with the square root. If it is a strongly positive or the negative skewness, go with the log 10. And if it is extreme, extremely positive or negative skewness, go with the reciprocal or inverse reciprocal skewness. Uh, one more thing which you need to take care of, uh, even in all the cases. So suppose if you are removing outlier, that also should go in your publication by saying so that other people should not uh, uh, should not uh, mistake your results. If it is an accidental outlier, you leave it. If it is a genuine outlier, and if you are removing it for the statistical to to follow the statistical assumptions, then it's better to you write in your result. If you are not doing anything, uh, if you are keeping the outlier without removing it, that also should go in in your publication. Many people are not doing it. Actually, most of the people are not doing it. But this is a way that you should do. Another thing is that if you are not following the normal distribution assumption, uh, that also should go in your uh, uh, publication. Because sometimes if you have a very high number of uh, sample data, it means the data point, then uh, ANOVA or T-test is somewhat uh, robust to handle the not normal distributed data. So those cases you should write. Similarly, if you are uh, making any uh, data transformation, to meet the criteria of the normal distribution, that also you should write when you are explaining your result uh, in the publication. Right? So this is the data transformation. The third and the, one of the most uh, important assumptions, at least for ANOVA, is homogeneity of variance. So what this homogeneity of variance means? So. Homogeneity, it's a word homo, right? Which means, okay, so which means equal, right? If it is hetero, hetero means unequal, right? So it's a, just a English translation if you can see in that way. So if it is a homogeneous, it means that equal or the same variance. And if it is a heterogeneous, then it means the variance is not same. It means the data is not same or equal, right? So homogeneity of variance, homo stands for same or equal. So a variance of a population, how it can be uh, analyzed or identified, how, you, how it can be identified is that it depends on the variation or the average of the squares of the distance that each value is from its mean. So it means that you have a mean that is a mu here, right? You have a mu here that is a mean, and this is your sample value. So summation of sample value minus mean chi square divided by n, in case if you are considering the population, in case if you are doing sample, then it is n minus one, right? So this is our formula for for extracting variance, and that uh, without variance, you will not be able to 
uh, do the uh, inferential statistics, at least uh, uh, t-test and uh, ANOVA, if the homogeneity of variance is not met and uh, variance is actually defined or it's actually coming from uh, this particular derivation, which are similar kind of stuff, but then this is on the variance and not on the sampling distribution. So, if you have the homogeneity of variance, it means that the, uh, if, uh, that the mean plus the variance is more or less similar, then this is one of the assumptions which is required to do the parametric test. One example you can see here that you do have a mean which is more or less similar to what in this case, but then you have the data in the wider distribution. It means that the variance uh, is high. So, in this case, uh, it does not meet the uh, criteria of the uh, parametric test, it means that this is not following the assumption of homogeneity of variance because the data is distributed in a larger uh, or in the wider space, right? Uh, yeah. So, in that in that way, uh, you, can, you, should, you should do the parametric test, I mean non-parametric test and not the parametric test. Another, uh, not a, uh, I mean, uh, uh, another factor to remember is that if the difference of the variance or the homogeneity of the variance between the two group is more or less up to four times, then you can still go with the uh, ANOVA and the t-test, it is robust. But if the difference is increasing from four to, I mean, here if you can see that it's three times, if it is increasing more than four times, then uh, it it induces the type one error in the ANOVA and the t-test. So, you should, you should better not do the parametric test and you should do the non-parametric test. How do you calculate this homogeneity of variance? Uh, variance, you know how to calculate the variance, uh, which I have showed you on the day one, uh, for each sample separately and then you make the ratio that is a F test of homogeneity of variance. So, in the F test of homogeneity of variance, you expect or your null hypothesis says that the variance of the first sample is equal to the variance of the second sample, right? Now, the variance of the first sample, if it is equal to the variance of the second sample, it means that your null hypothesis is true and your data is having the same variance, right? Uh, it requires two things to remember. For the first is that how do you do the variance calculation. So, S1 by S2, that is F, it means the ratio of the first uh, variance, the variance of the first sample by ratio, I mean, uh, 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 variance of the second sample. I think I have put a file in the day three group. If I have not done, I will do it now. There is an option of variance in the Excel sheet. It's a manual method. Of course, uh, with the statistics, it will do with more critical or more uh, advanced formula, but just in order to understand how this variance is calculated. So, there is a function verb, VAR in Excel to calculate the variance. Once you have the variance of this particular group called as control and this particular group called as treatment 1, you have the variance here, right? Variance 1 by variance 2. Now, what you do is that you see F is equals to variance of first sample divided by variance of second sample, right? So, once you do the division like variance of uh, control to variance of treatment, you will get some value. Now, this is your F. Now, uh, null hypothesis will be rejected only if this F is greater than the F critical value. Now, F critical value is, uh, is a table, right? I will just show you, there is, if you can see in the slide, uh, okay, if you see in the slide, you will see that there is a link. Let us open this link and see what this. So, F value table or critical F value, right? You can see here that your F value here is 5.1814, right? So, it means uh, the variance of the first sample to the variance of, I mean, ratio of the first, ratio of the variance of first sample to the second sample is 5.18. Now, you have to compare it with FC value. FC value is what? It's a F critical value. 
f critical value can be find out with the formula given here which says which says f of numerator i mean uh, uh, of the see numerator is what here if you see the formula it says that s1 by s2 or whichever is greater so here in our case this is greater and this is a smaller so it will be in the numerator and this will be in the denominator now the numerator degree of freedom so degree of freedom we know that n minus 1 it means that whatever the number you have you subtract it with 1 and that is the degree of freedom so 9 since we have 10 10 samples here so 9 and 9 is the degree of freedom and then i am assuming the alpha value as 0.05 again as i said that alpha value depends on you if you want your significance test uh, of 5% chances that is 0.05 it to tell right so in this case you see the f critical value table i will show you how you can see the f critical table value as i said that the numerator is 9 and the denominator is 9 right so here you have the numerator in 9 and then here you have the denominator in 9 right and since we are using the two tail and 0.05 as a alpha value so this particular value you will see now what you will see here is that f value is 4.03 this particular value now you say that this 4.03 is greater than 5.18 or not if 5.18 is greater than 4.03 it means that you reject the hypothesis it means that your sample does not have the same variance or it does not assume or it does not follow the assumption of homogeneity of variance so in that case you should do the non parametric what i just wanted to show you at least for today because that is very important uh in a quick recap of 2 minute i will show you what we have seen the statistical analysis or the inferential test depends on the sample where you have the independent sample or the repeated sample with the independent sample what i mean is that just a moment yeah so with the independent sample what i mean is that uh, in the different conditions or in the different experimental conditions you give independent uh, samples or independent subjects that is independent sample so if your if your sample is independent you do the independent sample t test or normal anova or non i mean equivalent non parametric test if you have uh, repeated samples it means that uh, you are keeping the same animals or same plants or same cells uh, in two different experiments in a repeated manner then that is a repeated sample and in that case you have to do paired sample t test or you have to do repeated anova right that is different we will see tomorrow what these tests means for the significance test important is to understand the null hypothesis always says that there is no difference between the group and most of the time in our experiments we intend that null hypothesis is rejected so that we can provide some meaningful information out of our experiment if the null hypothesis is rejected it means that the alternate hypothesis exists which means that whatever the difference is obtained in the two conditions are real to understand or to infer the if the null hypothesis is rejected or true we have to take the help of p value it means that the chance or the percentage of the chance or the probability or not the probability similar to probability uh, the chance up to how much uh, percentage we can say that the difference is by chance or it's real in most of the cases we are using alpha value that is a p value uh, of 5% it means that 0.05 anything we are considering in most of the cases if uh, p value uh, is less than 0.05 it means that less than 5% of the chance uh, of uh, uh, random or by chance result we consider it as null hypothesis is rejected and alternate hypothesis is true in this case when we are keeping the alpha value 0.05 or less than or greater than 0.05 we tend to increase or decrease the type 1 error or type 2 error so type 1 error says that we rejected the null hypothesis even though when it was true when it means that 
we are keeping the alpha value less than or equals to 0.05 it means that there are still 5% chance that the result has came purely by chance and uh, uh, so we are rejecting the null hypothesis but then it can be true similarly in the type 2 error we accept the null hypothesis even though the null hypothesis is rejected if we are keeping two stringent alpha values right so in most of the cases we see that we keep 0.05 uh, which is a good compromise between type 1 and type 2 error tomorrow uh, if i am not wrong then aditya will explain you in much better way that uh, uh, what should be the p value and how much cautious we should be when we are using p value in our significance test now it is difficult to do the parameter i mean choose which test you have to apply so in that case two basic distinction can be made between the parametric and the non parametric test in the parametric test it assumes the statistical distribution with some known mathematical properties and uh, these properties are if there should be no outlier the sample size should be same in all the conditions data should be normally distributed and there should be homogeneity of variance so equal variance right in all the groups basically in non parametric conditions you only have to follow that the data is coming independently and it does not rely too much into all other different assumptions like normality and the homogeneity of variance and outliers and then there is a equal test i mean equivalent test of parametric to non parametric so if you can see here in this graph i mean in this flow chart you will see that pair t test is equivalent to wilcoxon uh, sign rank test if it is uh, independent then you have independent sample t test then you have man witney test if you have anova i mean independent anova then you have kruskal kruskal wallis test if you have uh, uh, repeated uh, measures then you have uh, non parametric multiple comparisons so like this there are equivalent tests we saw that there are outliers means it is going away from the uh, most of the data set and we can define it with the box plot or the scatter plot there are several uh, 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 ways to remove or to keep and but then in any cases you have to report the outliers in your result the data should be normal it means a bell curve if it is not following two ways to identify numerical and graphical in numerical you have skewness and kurtosis and spiroval test in graphical you have a histogram and normal qq plot i have showed you that there are some formula for skewness and kurtosis as well as spiroval test spiroval test is mostly uh, dependent on normal quartile quartile plot and this is the normal quartile quartile plot where you have the real data it means the observed data and the data when you are putting into the normal distribution curve and if if it is coming in a straight line it's a normal distribution if it is going away then it's a positively or negatively skew uh, you can see the example over here it the uh, positive and the negative skewness and then you have the data transformation in the case you are doing the data transformation you definitely have to report it into your publication then you have the homogeneity of variance it means that the all comparison group should have the same variance variance can be identified with the help of uh, uh variance can be identified with the help of the formulas the summation of the value minus mean square divided by n in case of population in case of sample n minus 1 and uh, uh, and uh, just in order to keep in mind if the value is more than four times different in the homogeneity of variance the or in the the difference in the variance then we should not use the parametric test we should go for the non parametric test um the way to calculate the variance homogeneity of variance one is the f test which is a very minimal uh, using very minimal uh, calculations however then there is a levins test which is by far the most common test used for the homogeneity of variance and uh, that we will see anyway in the uh, in the practicals and how do you calculate the f test it's a ratio between the uh, between the variance of the first group by the variance of the second group or in case if the variance of the second group is higher then it always have to be in the positive so the variance of the second group goes in the top and the variance of the first group goes in the denominator uh, 
and this is a one way you can calculate your variance in Excel and then using the FC that is F critical table uh, in the internet you can download it as the link is given here and uh, by by using the degree of freedom of numerator and denominator and considering the two tail you can match if the value is if the F value that you have calculated is greater than the FC value then it means you reject the hypothesis and if you reject the hypothesis, it means that the, that the test is significant. So you cannot use it. You have to use it when the F value is less than epsilon. 